All right, welcome back everybody. We are here on what we've called on our agenda, Housing 101. And um, we brought back uh, Gus and Jen from VHCB. We have Tony Pickett here with us um, from the Grounded Solutions Network. We have Chris Donnelly from Champlain Housing Trust and Nancy Owens from Evernorth. And um, the reason for this is that, again, based on the last conversation that we have, there's a lot of affordable housing in, in, that's gonna be in the air over the next few years. And it's important for this committee to really horn in on what the vocabulary is and what, what we're talking about when we talk about things like 4% deals or 9% deals or shared equity housing. And so I asked these folks to put together a presentation um, and they, they had asked me to, to, to weeks ago to, to consider something like this. And I was able to, I'm glad to be able to fit it in here. And, and this is training for us. This is, this is to help us understand some more of the language and situations that we've been talking about and learning on the fly. Um, but with, with what's ahead of us, I think it's an appropriate time to try to take a, take a minute and understand what it is we talk about when we talk about affordable housing. So um, with that, I'll just pass the microphone to Gus. Welcome back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Gus Selig, uh, Director for the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Jen Holler is with me and she'll screen share in just a moment. Um, in thinking about 101, uh, somebody once said to me, history begins the day somebody shows up. Um, so for me, the history in working on this issue in Vermont uh, goes to the mid 80s when I was at the organization uh, now known as Capstone Community Action. And the housing market was changing very rapidly in Vermont. And starting about 1985, real estate was going up at about 1% a month. Uh, Lakefront was going up at 2% a month. And we were concerned with the displacement of people. And, and Jen, you can begin to screen share. Um, from their communities and opportunities for people to um, uh, live in the communities they'd been in, concerned about displacement, concerned about the impacts of gentrification, concerned about the need to preserve existing housing stock, and looking for, in the age of Ronald Reagan, uh, a fiscally sound approach to doing that. And um, so let's go to the next slide, Jen. Um, and, and here's what happened. Um, in 1985, 100 families in Essex, a community with a great school system, were displaced from their community when, after getting all kinds of HUD funding, rental assistance, accelerated depreciation, the owner of that development just went in and prepaid his mortgage one day and doubled the rents. Um, that same owner had a project in Moortown, Vermont, and he converted it to condominiums. And there was a real sense of potential loss. Um, and so people began to talk about what could we do about that? The federal government's approach to affordable housing was 20 years of affordability was plenty. And we saw that that was really short and we had some big projects on the horizon. And one of them you're looking at Northgate Apartments where the end of that 20 years was within a three year period, a big issue for the city of Burlington. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So a coalition was developed that created the Housing and Conservation Board in 1987. And uh, we were talking about our statute in a different context a few weeks ago, but we were told to develop the capacity to undertake the housing mission across the state of Vermont and to work with nonprofits and co-ops to provide housing that would be perpetually affordable. And then in in allocating funds, we were asked specifically to consider the effect, the long-term effects of proposed activities, and with respect to housing, the likelihood that it would pr both prevent the loss of subsidized housing units uh, and be of perpetual duration. So that's the charge you gave us. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we've created across the state um, a network of nonprofits to undertake the mission in most of your communities. I think they're viewed uh, as really becoming community development offices for towns that do not have community development staff, which is, which is most of our communities. Um, and that network was not what in the mid eighties, what it is today, the Champlain Housing Trust, uh, when we came into existence had a staff of one and a half, and I think had funded three single family homes. 
Um, so it was part of our charge to go out and make that happen. Um, let's go to the next slide. This is Northgate Apartments. Uh, it's an aerial view, and you can see that how close it is to Lake Champlain. And I'm just going to speak briefly to the power of permanent affordability um, here. We invested $2.9 million in a little over $20 million purchase from the owners who were out-of-state investors um, and renovation of that property. And it was in terrible shape. Um, that was real money in 1989, uh, $2.9 million. There was a surplus that Governor Kunin proposed that we get of $20 million that made that possible. If you think about the impact of permanent affordability as opposed to short-term subsidies over time, not only did that only cost us $8,600 per unit, but if you divide it by the 30 years of affordability since that time, it's cost $287 a year for the state of Vermont to have not displaced 336 households. If we'd use the model of private investment, which is what people do in real estate, and you figure out eventually you're going to sell it, and because of its location so close to the lake and the potential for condominium conversion, uh, it was viewed as high then, and I think it would be higher today. I think more important, if you said to us today, well, let's convert it. We'll build somewhere else that probably won't be as convenient to services and community. 300, building 336 homes in Vermont today would cost something north of $100 million. So I would say to you that the fiscally sound approach to the policy of permanent affordability just makes all the sense in the world from my perspective, you don't, I think you can be, a, and it was very interesting when we were working on this back in the 80s, um, Alan Gear, husband of Sarah Gear, who eventually became the Republican leader in the House, uh, became quite a proponent of this because of its, what he considered it as a fiscally sound, fiscally conservative approach to using the state's dollars, along with the idea of leverage. This was a tax credit deal as we are talking about Nancy's organization was at the center of it back then. Let's move on to the next slide. Uh, this is a different kind of opportunity, and we've talked to you about key downtown buildings across the state. In the late, this was at, in the 90s, this was the Burlington bus station. It, there was a fire that broke out. There were about, I think, 40 some apartments that were kind of rabbit warren, not very well uh, in good shape. And we had a debate about whether or not the public should invest in this building. And one of my colleagues said, we don't need to make an investment in this building. Um, the private market will take care of it. And the counter argument um, was, if we don't make a, a public investment in this building, poor people will not be able to live in downtown Burlington. Um, and I think there's been all kinds of investment in and around the King Street neighborhood and in the old North End. And I think it doesn't, you, if you just look at what the real estate market has been like, that's meant that people can continue to afford to live in a community where real estate prices and rents are really high. So I think, again, it has real long-term benefit, this ideal of permanent affordability. Let's move on to the next slide. Um, Another fire ravaged building. This is in downtown Brattleboro. The fire chief wanted to tear it down the next day. Um, and and uh, the Wyndham Windsor Housing Trust stepped in, bought it, saved it. I would say to you two things about this. One is that some of you are aware of the story of the Brooks House, which had a fire just, I don't know, six, seven, eight years ago, a uh, much bigger building around the corner. And I think the fact that this building was saved gave private investors the courage to save the Brooks House. This building has affordable apartments. There's an arts education program on the second floor. Um, the Brooks House is renting apartments for $1,800 and $2,000 a month. So again, Brattleboro is a different market than Burlington, but the power of permanently protecting assets, I think uh, the, for me, the case is very clear that you, you need permanent affordability in one's approach uh, to affordable housing. Um, to talk about single family housing for a moment, and again, the power of this approach over time. Uh, this is the quintessential Vermont Cape. This one happens to be in Brookline, Vermont. 
we invested $12,000 uh, to help the first family buy it um, back about 1991 or 92. Um, that family divorced. Eventually, the woman remarried. They moved on to conventional home ownership. A couple bought it, uh, or a single mom bought it uh, the second time. Um, she eventually got married, and they moved on. Uh, then a local realtor who couldn't find anything she could afford in the area owned it for about 10 years. Each of these folks was able, and Chris will probably talk some about an evaluation they've done, to take some equity with them when they left. What the chart is telling you is that even though there was a decline in the market from the 2005 purchase to the 2018 purchase, the homeowner still walked away with $17,000 in equity. The, the value of the subsidy grew. So with a $12,000 investment, we've now launched four families into home ownership. Several of them moved on to the conventional market. And the cost per year is $428 um, to have affordable housing. We'll move on to one more slide, and then I'll wrap up. Um, this is what we call a dual goal project. We cut 10 acres off of a farm that we were conserving in Norwich, Vermont. Um, 14 single family homes were built here. They're relatively modest, 1,000 to 1,300 square feet. Um, first one was built uh, in the late, in the early 90s for about $12,000 of subsidy, about an $80,000 cost. Um, most recently, uh, the last sale was at about a hundred in 2018 of a home resale was at about $160,000. But this is a community um, where the average home last year sold for $665,000. So again, we think that the power of this investment um, is very strong um, and we are preserving and recycling the housing for community need um, without having to deeply subsidize these units over and over again. That doesn't mean we don't make additional investments from time to time. Uh, and in this case, recently, a local doctor made a charitable donation for solar um, to help the 14 residents of this neighborhood. So um, I think that's the end of the slideshow. We can go back to full screen. Um, and I guess I would just say a couple things that that we developed a nonprofit delivery system in Vermont because they would be the people who would steward resources for the long term as mission driven organizations. We've used the community land trust model, which Mr. Pickett will talk about and Chris will talk about more for single family home ownership. But we really wanted not to have people displaced from their communities. We really wanted a tool that could withstand the power of gentrification. Um, in a, in a substantial way. Um, in lots of places across the country, people live further and further from employment centers. That's a climate issue. That's a tr transportation issue. It's a family stress issue. When you have to travel long ways to get to employment, you're far away from where your kids are in school. Um, so all of the things that are embodied in our mission and in our housing policies in Vermont around smart growth, around reinvesting in community centers really are tied together along with the, this idea of making a long-term commitment uh, to the assets we invest in and having those assets be there for the next generation. So I'm happy to take questions, but I think you probably want to hear from your other witnesses and maybe take questions at the end. One last point I just want to make to your previous discussion, because Representative Murphy raised the question of the importance of rental housing. And I, I guess I would just say the average single family home that was built in Vermont, according to VHFA, went for 450,000 last year. The average VHFA buyer buys for about 180,000. Nobody's building those homes. One of the reasons we have a rental crisis is that people who might be able to afford a home for 160, 180, $200,000, um, have no place to buy. And so tackling that part of the market as we launch this initiative is really important to get some people who would like to become homeowners to have have them have that ability and free up some of that rental stock. So I'm gonna stop there, thank you.
Thank you, Gus. And, and I think we will just do the presentations and save questions for the end. Um, next up on our agenda is Tony Pickett. Tony, welcome to General Housing and Military Affairs. Thank you very much for your time today. And I'm just going to uh, share my screen, but I got a message that says my screen sharing is disabled. Is there a way to correct that? Um, Ron, can we make Tony a co-host? You are now a co-host. Thank you very much. Put that up. Slideshow. And this and the slide deck is is on our web page as well. Great. Hopefully you all can see my presentation now. Um, and uh, again, my name is Tony Pickett. I am the CEO of the Grounded Solutions Network and I'm based in Washington, DC. Uh, Grounded Solutions is a national nonprofit network. We have just over 200 members and we serve all 50 states, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Um, our organization was actually formed in 2016 by the merger of what was called the National Community Land Trust Network and an organization called the Cornerstone Partnership. Um, you can read it there for yourself. Our mission uh, really is to promote the uh, expansion of affordable housing solutions, as we say, that last for generations. Whenever possible, we would like affordable housing to be permanently affordable. We support our network by providing capacity building and technical assistance. And the organizations within our network include uh, predominantly community land trusts, but also Habitat for Humanity affiliates and municipal housing programs. Um, some are grassroots co uh, community organizers, as well as resident leaders. Um, we also provide policy expertise and conduct research to support municipalities and advocates across the housing sector who want to adopt our, our approach. Um, really, I, I like to start uh, these conversations with giving a little grounding in the origin, particularly of the community land trust model um, that actually comes out of the civil rights movement. Um, really in Albany, Georgia in 1961, uh, the first mass protest movement of the civil rights era took place. And as a result of that, um, activists, including a, a young activist with the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee named Charles Sherrod, who is pictured there um, on that slide, um, actually came together in Albany uh, to really support local residents in obtaining community ownership of land as a solution to retaliation through eviction of black tenant farming families from their homes as a result of them advocating for the right to vote and, and actually registering to vote. Um, so really um, it was a response to the overwhelming racism of the time. Um, at its height, New Communities, uh, which was the organization that ultimately became the first community land trust in 1969, um, it controlled over 5,600 acres of land in Albany, Georgia, making it the largest tract of land owned by African Americans in the United States at the time. And so they were trying to both stabilize the families in terms of housing, but also give them a, a viable means to have the land to actually uh, farm and create a living for themselves. And, and so when I talk about this, I talk about the fact that um, really um, racial equity is in the organizational DNA of the community land trust. And one other thing I'll, I'll point out amongst all the folks uh, who are around the table to form new communities, you can see them there. Um, certainly John Lewis played a part but also Slater King and C.B. King, who were local residents in Albany, professional black businessmen. Those are first cousins of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So that is the direct family connection to the civil rights movement as well. And in 2019, we celebrated 50 years of growth of the 
Community Land Trust. And so at that point, there were over 250 community land trust organizations in the country stewarding approximately 12,000 homes uh, within a larger, what we call shared equity housing sector, which controlled and stewarded 250,000 homes. And you can kind of see on this slide, it sort of shows you the, what I call housing continu continuum from private market home ownership to private market rental. And, and there are a variety of options in between, but in that sort of blue elliptical area, I would say that's what we count as our shared equity housing sector. And you can see community land trusts highlighted there as well. Um, in the late 1980s, 1990s, that was a real period of urban growth for community land trusts. And that's when uh, Burlington moved forward and created uh, the Burlington uh, housing trust uh, that is today known as the Champlain Housing Trust. Uh, so uh, again, there was a, a great expansion of community land trust activity during that time period. And, and today there are community land trust innovations happening all over the country um, in places like Denver, Colorado, where a regional community land trust is operating in the Metro Denver area with $24 million of philanthropic support leveraging public investment provided by local municipalities in the Denver region. In Atlanta, Georgia, there is a land trust operating that is partnering with their local land bank to access some 877 acres of uh, property that is controlled by municipal entities. In Houston, Texas, there is an ambitious plan to create uh, 1,100 community land trust homes over the next five year period with support coming from hurricane relief funding that has been received by the city of Houston. Um, local jurisdictions across the country that are supporting CLTs include Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland, Oakland, California, Seattle, Washington, Richmond, Virginia, the list goes on. Um, one thing I wanna highlight is the excitement that is happening uh, today around shared equity and community land trust is really based on the performance of the programs. In 2019, our Grounded Solutions research team partnered with the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy and created the first ever shared equity housing performance report. And, and the outcomes of that report really validate uh, our belief that um, shared equity housing and even community land trusts in particular um, really add a, a great value in terms of benefiting low and moderate income populations. Um, one of the criticisms that we always hear in relation to shared equity home ownership in particular is that it limits wealth creation because it prevents the homeowner from selling and taking the full appreciation or equity that has built up in the home over time. We, we limit the amount of appreciation that can be taken in order to keep the home affordable for subsequent buyers. So it, it is really a, a move that creates a sustainable and long-term permanently affordable home. But um, we also push back on those uh, who criticize the limited wealth creation by pointing out that over the 33 year period of our study, which encompassed 4,000 homes in 58 programs across the country, um, really the uh, median initial investment by families in purchasing those shared equity homes was just over $1,800. And at the end of a five to seven year period of tenure, when a majority of those families decided to sell, uh, the median uh, accumulated equity that they took was $14,000. So anywhere that you can get a return like that um, outside of uh, gambling in Las Vegas, please let us know because uh, we're not aware uh, of where that occurs. So we say to folks, um, it actually is uh, a wealth creating device. And then the other part of that is that um, six out of 10 of the shared equity homeowners that actually chose to sell their homes used their gain to actually go on to purchase a traditional market rate home, which was what Gus was referring to earlier. So the majority of folks who are buying these homes who are first time home buyers, low, moderate income families who otherwise could not get into home ownership, 
they're making their way into home ownership and they're making their way on to traditional market rate home ownership. Uh, that is a trend that we see happening across the country. Um, also, uh, just in these times when everyone is focused on the racial equity impact of public investments and, and housing programs in particular, um, we point out that the study also shows that um, at the beginning of that 33 year period, um, we had about a 13% rate of minority home ownership in shared equity housing. And that increased uh, during the 2013 to 2018 period to 43%. So we're increasingly serving households of color is the point to make there. And so uh, again, part of our excitement right now is that um, we are really pushing our sector. I have challenged all of our members uh, over the next 10 years to increase the amount of shared equity housing from the just over 250,000 units that we have on the ground today to over a million homes. And so again, tying this to our goal and our, our path toward increasing racial equity. And, and we understand now that housing really shapes the future of the family, uh, the social determinants of health. Um, where people live um, really affects their long-term health outcomes. Uh, COVID-19 has taught us that housing is healthcare. We cannot really um, expect families to withstand the impact of pandemic type events uh, unless they are stably housed. And, and also we like to point out that housing is really driving economic activity. Um, if we're successful in creating a million homes over the next 10 years, um, we're looking at that uh, potentially generating uh, $45 billion of annual economic activity and supporting just over 6,000 jobs. Uh, so it's more than just housing that we're talking about when we talk about investing in shared equity and community land trust programs. And so I will end there and stop sharing and turn it over to the next presenter. Thank you, Tony. And we'll be back with questions. Um, next up we have um, oh, Nancy Owens. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, Nancy. How are you? I'm good. Welcome back. Thank you so much for having me and i um, glad to join this group. Um, I am a co-president of Ever North, which is a nonprofit organization that serves Vermont, New Hampshire, and Maine with community development, um, financing, and development services for housing and economic development projects. And you may be familiar with the organization Housing Vermont, which has been active in Vermont for 30 years. Housing Vermont and Northern New England Housing Investment Fund based in Portland, Maine, merged this past July um, to better serve the whole region. So that is Evernorth and I have been with Evernorth 20 plus years and worked in this arena for a long time. So, um, I was going to take a few minutes to just describe the affordable rental housing tax credit program and development in Vermont. So shifting from the home ownership and the shared equity model that Tony has focused on and returning back to some of the comments that Gus brought up around affordable rental housing. And I'm just going to go from a very high perspective and I'm not using slides, so I'm trying to keep it simple. But like, you know, where does the money come from? Who's doing the work? What are the community benefits and what are some of the key issues and trends um, coming up? I'm not gonna go into the detailed rules of every person that's involved. It would be a lot and take a lot more time. If there's things that are of interest, we can always come back and revisit or get you more detailed information. But I'm just gonna start with a really simple concept around, around the money, the question of the money. And so for simplicity's sake, let's just say that a new housing project costs $100 to develop. And of that $100, two or $3 is going to pay for the land. And 70, $75 is gonna pay for the construction. So all the infrastructure, the building, all of the activity. And the, the balance of the money, the $20, $25 that's left of that $100 is covering the non-construction costs, the things like the legal and the accounting and the 
loan fees and reserves, the architects and surveys and all of those costs. So that's kind of like how them what's involved in a very quick picture. And so like, then where, where does that money, where's that hundred dollars come from? It gets to be more complicated. We talk about the capital stack. And I know folks have seen some of these, you know, pro formas and see there's 10, 12, 14 sources of funding that come together to create that, that hundred dollars. But in general, maybe five to 12 of that hundred is coming in a conventional permanent debt, a mortgage from a bank. Um, about 60 or $65 of that hundred is coming from private equity that's raised through the sale of the federal tax credits. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that program in particular. That leaves about 15 or $18 from other federal public funds, grant sources, things that are familiar to you, I'm sure, the, the home funds, the National Housing Trust Fund, the Community Development Block Grant Funds, those are federal dollars coming to our state that are administered by VHCB and by the Agency of Commerce. And then the last piece, but, but an important piece is that last eight to $10 that's coming from the state, that's coming from the housing trust fund, um, the, the funds that you, you are um, appropriating to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. So just a quick snapshot of like those parts and pieces and nothing, Nothing can be built, nothing can move forward. A developer can't close a transaction and go until all those pieces are in place and that they can demonstrate they have a financially sound project. And a, a gap is a gap. You don't, you're, you're short $5 <laughs> or $50, um, the project's not gonna move forward. So funding all of those pieces in that capital stack are, are essential and critical. Um, and just, just to think about it, the way that the housing is affordable is if you think about conventional financing, um, a private developer would go out and um, put in maybe 5, 10, 20% of their own equity into a transaction and finance 80% and carry that debt and co cover that debt through their operations. Affordable housing is, is balanced just about the opposite. We, we bring 80% 80, 80 or more in equity to the table of, of grant funds, you know, equity from the sale of credits and so forth, and are only financing five, 10 or 15%. And that's how it's affordable because we're not carrying all of that debt. And so the rents are going towards covering the operating expenses, but they can be much lower because they're not paying for that mortgage. So it's just sort of a structural way to think about that. I want to just talk about the private equity, which is the largest source of funds and comes from the sale of the low income housing tax credits. And that's a role that Evernorth plays a strong part in, um, in that we're raising capital through multi-investor funds. So every state is allocated tax credits from the federal government. Developers make proposals to um, acquire those credits and um, VHFA is our allocating agency, as you know. Um, the proposals are evaluated against a qualified allocation plan that's unique to every state. And so every state gets to determine, you know, within a framework, how it wants to prioritize the use of those funds. Um, there, are two, the, there are two other federal programs that are also used, the National Re um, Rehabilitation Investment Tax Credit for Historic Properties, which were used in projects like the Wilder Block, the Brooks Block, um, the property in Burlington downtown. Um, as well as you were referencing earlier, the difference between four and 9% credits, so the 4% credits. Those other resources are useful and um, beneficial. They're not as valuable as that allocated 9% credit that VHVA is issuing out because they don't add as much value. They create some other gaps that need to be funded from other resources. So there's a lot of people involved in the financing construction of projects. We've talked a little bit about the public and private funders. There's real estate developers and all of their, their professionals that assist them, the contractors, you know, the architects, all of the private enterprises that are involved in the construction. Um, and then two other critical players that are distinct to the tax credit financing are called syndicate, the syndicators and the investors. So Evernorth is a syndicator and our role is to raise capital 
from the investors for affordable housing. We do that by creating large multi-state, multi-investment funds. Um, and we match the investors with the developers. So we just closed on a fund of $60 million that's investing capital into projects across Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Um, the investors are, are typically, for the most part, are large, are banks. And um, banks are driven to invest in tax credit financing because of the Community Reinvestment Act, which is asking each bank to demonstrate how it's um, supporting investment, how it's using investment dollars in the communities where it's based. So each bank's geographic footprint drives and defines their investment interest. So you won't see Wells Fargo Bank investing in Vermont because Wells Fargo does not have any deposits in Vermont or doesn't have any branches. Um, our two largest investors in Vermont and been just really great partners with all of the organizations are People's United Bank and TD Bank, each of whom have invested over $100 million through Evernorth into affordable housing all across the state. And most every single bank in Vermont has participated over the past 30 years at some level, purchasing state tax credits, um, low-income housing tax credits, historic tax credits. And we're really very fortunate that um, this community has supported our work. So finally, so we talked a lot about the money and the parts and pieces, but the key piece are the developers. Um, and tax credit affordable housing in Vermont is really um, dominated by the mission-based nonprofit developers. And Gus showed you those organizations and talked a little bit about the founding of that whole network. Um, I just wanna say that network is not, um, is, there's not a network like that in other states that we are very well served by this nonprofit network and by its um, coordination and collaboration. And um, I wanna talk back on the issue of permanent affordability and how it brings all these pieces together. Um, that permanent affordability is a key policy provision that's in the VHB statute, as Gus said, and it's in the QAP. It undergirds um, the whole process. And so if a developer is using any of those funds, they're committing to perpetual affordability. Um, that's not the same and across the nation, I think 41 states have a requirement that give a longer period than the federal statute requires, but only two other states, um, Massachusetts and Michigan, have that perpetual affordability that we have. And why does that matter? Um, we've talked about that the permanent affordability creates the community assets that would otherwise be converted to market rate housing. And Gus's example of Northgate is, is a great one. There have been others more recent than that. Um, and um, and they're happening all across the nation and, um, where homes are being lost and converted. Um, the public investment is made and that, that appreciation that's gained over time should be appreciated should that stays in the community. Again, sort of a similar concept to the shared equity model that we're, we're, we're the real estate's appreciating and we're keeping it uh, um, tied to the use that we, we began it with, with low and moderate income housing. Mission-based nonprofits are so well suited to guard the um, long-term affordability because it is their purpose as an organization. They have that commitment to serve low and moderate income people. And they're not looking to cash out of the properties, but instead are focused on um, serving the community. In addition to just being strong, um, having that central purpose, the mission nonprofits um, typically bring other kinds of services, whether that's um, counseling, financial counseling, or SASH services, or transportation services, food access services. A mission-based nonprofit owner of affordable housing um, really enhances the whole property and brings a lot of benefits. And from a syndication and investor perspective, that is well recognized. Um, the investors have a lot of respect and for the capacity of the Vermont nonprofits and their performance and their good stewardship of the properties that they've invested in. We have never had um, a, a tax credit recapture or a failure in any way on any of these properties, no major audit findings, 
And so again, there's a huge amount of confidence in, in this group. It's well functioning and effective. Um, and it's proved its wor worth, I think, over the years, whether that was in the 2008 economic crash, the, tropical, the work that was done post Tropical Storm Irene, the, the ability to deploy capital quickly through the housing revenue bond, and now during the COVID pandemic, how the nonprofit network has stepped up um, to support our communities. So I just want to end with um, just a, a little um, a little warning or risk about the future ahead of us, uh, in particular to the tax credit arena. Um, as you know, there's so much pressure on the housing market right now, and it's so difficult for people to find safe and decent homes to live in. But there are some threats to the credit program um, from, from some bad actors in the industry who are aggressively litigating um, where they're aggressively litigating to convert tax credit properties to market rate housing. Um, and we're seeing these companies grow in um, more bold. And um, even as the industry is calling them out on it, and we are seeking federal legislative ch changes to disallow these aggressive practices, um, one of the key preventative measures is just what we already have in place, which is perpetual affordability. That covenant is a protection against this kind of activity where homes are being converted from affordable housing into market rate housing. So it's protecting our investments forever and reducing the opportunity for those kinds of market rate conversions. And it's, it's really uh, makes for stronger and healthier communities. We don't want to be, if we're losing housing and building housing, we're never going to catch up. If, 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 those, if we're losing, market, losing affordable housing out of the market to market, how can we possibly ever catch up and, and fill that gap? So we need to sustain all of the investments that we've made over time. But I will end there. I hope we have enough time for questions still, and Chris. Thank you, Nancy. Um, an incredibly important segment of understanding for us. Thank you. Um, Chris Donnelly, um, welcome. You are um, you were the architect of this presentation today, so thank you for helping to put it together, but you have a serious part to play here. And then after you, then we will open it up to conversation, uh, questions and answers. Great, thank you, Chair Stevens. And um, uh, for the record, it's Chris Donnelly with the Champlain Housing Trust. Um, I feel like I, um, it's strange, I haven't been in your committee yet this, this session. I felt like I was here, almost lived here last year. So um, it's nice to, um, to meet uh, many of you. I'm just gonna share the screen and show a, a quick little presentation that gets more into the details on um, um, uh, of what the shared equity program is that uh, Tony had uh, um, uh, described. So um, since this is my first time here, I just want to quickly outline um, what the Champlain Housing Trust is. We serve the three Northwest counties of the state. You can see some data points there for us. Um, I like to think about our housing as uh, we serve, we have roughly six or 7,000 people that go to bed in one of our homes every night. So it's really the size of a, um, a small community in the, in the state. We also have a lot of commercial spaces. Um, Gus showed a, a slide of a um, building in downtown Burlington. Um, and then we steward um, a, a lot of community assets for, in, uh, for affordable housing in, per, in per, perpetual uh, nature. So um, let's see. Um, you've heard a lot about, I'm sure in the past few months about the, um, the difficulties around um, people accessing housing. This is just some just quick slide of some of the data. The one I'll point out here is that in Chittenden County, the median sale price last year was $339,000 for a single family home. You'd have to earn $93,000 to afford that. And that's $20,000 more than the median household income makes. So this is a huge gap between what is um, out there and what people can afford. And as we touched on earlier, as a renter in the high, high rental um, costs now, it's really hard even to save for the down payment. 
uh, Tony touched on some of this and Gus as well, um, just some of the reasons why we do the shared equity program, um, the shared equity home ownership program, we protect neighborhoods from gentrification, we help build wealth. Um, Tony had a number that was sort of similar to what we have here in Vermont, um, of uh, creating about almost $17,000 in wealth for our, our owners. Um, we enable mobility. The other thing that I like to, uh, to point out is even through the ups and downs of the market, um, a national study showed that owners in the shared equity program are 10 times less likely to go into foreclosure than the regular market. And we serve lower income people. And again, this uh, one of the threads here is that we lock in the public investments forever. So I just wanted to walk you through what it is, what it, uh, how a person actually goes through this process um, to become an, an owner through our program. Um, and I'll get to the numbers in, in a little bit. Uh, um, but the first thing is if when people want to become a homeowner, we, uh, we encourage anyone to, to take home buyer education. We offer classes or um, home ownership centers around the state that offer home ownership uh, classes um, as well as counseling. So people come to us and then they, um, they take this class and become mortgage ready. If they can, if they can um, become mortgage ready, but the mortgage that they can uh, get from a bank or credit union isn't enough um, to buy on the open market, then our option is, is a really good one for them. If they can buy on the open market, that's great. Um, but um, many people just cannot. So we help them get mortgage ready. If they wanna buy one of our homes, there are multiple ways that we have um, created these affordable homes over time. There may not be a lot available at any given time, but these are the different types of ways. So people start thinking about where they want to live and what kind of home they want to buy. So there might be a home that's in the portfolio that's coming up for sale. Uh, we work with Habitat chapters. We actually, I just heard yesterday that we have six or seven Habitat homes being built right now or in development, and they have 200 people that have ex expressed interest. So there's a high demand for this. Um, we are actually building, um, going to be under construction this summer for new condos in Winooski. Um, that has been funded by VHCB and also has been accessing the new market tax credits program. Um, we, at times, have been, there's been funding available to purchase homes that have been foreclosed or need, need rehab. Um, and uh, so there's a variety of ways that people, uh, people can, um, or that we bring the homes into our portfolio. Um, this is uh, just an example of, of someone that's bought one of our homes, Ian Boyd. Um, he called this program a, not just a fiscal fitness program, but a physical fitness program because he, um, as part of his process of spending three years to buy a home, he sold his car and started walking to work. Um, so he really, he worked very hard to, to get to the point where he could buy a home, save the money. Um, and now he's, um, he and his wife have two kids. When he was um, ready to buy, when he was um, uh, found a home he wanted to, uh, to purchase, um, he hired his own lawyer, his own home inspector, and he got his own mortgage. While we will help people along the way and give people training and support and, um, uh, and help them any way they need to, um, they do need to take ownership over this process and they need to be ready to buy. So we really, we give them all the tools and then they, um, uh, they act on them. When they get to the point of uh, closing, the local nonprofit um, CHT or other nonprofits in the state will um, steward that subsidy that's attached to the property uh, to, that ensures the affordability. The original subsidies usually come from BHCB or the state affordable housing tax credit. The buyer gets their own mortgage through a credit union or a uh, local bank. Some credit unions have actually created specific um, uh, products uh, and mortgages for our, our buyers because they know it's so safe. So they are portfolio products. This is a, just a quick snapshot of the types of people that have purchased our homes. You see over a third have kids. The average length of tenure isn't that much different than first time home buyers, but the uh, median income is much less. It's about 70%. Um, and I think Tony alluded to this too in the past, in more recent years, I think there's been a lot more intention at um, doing outreach to uh, communities of color. So in the last five years, 25% of the people that have bought our homes have been people of color. We've added translation, interpretation services. 
And that's been really important. And I know there's been a lot of talk about the workforce in this committee and workforce housing. This is the workforce. These are the people that are uh, taking care of our kids, um, taking care of our health and uh, making the economy go. Uh, this is uh, just a quick slide of um, uh, Charles and Beatrice that bought in, uh, in Burlington. Um, I remember sitting with them about two weeks after they bought their first home um, through us. And just the way he described it was just that he had arrived. Um, and it's um, it's hard to put, it was hard to, it's hard to put that in, in a, uh, well, as eloquently as he did. He just, he felt like he was just finally set and he could take care of his family and, and he could um, uh, settle into, into this, uh, into Burlington. After the owners buy the homes, they're all they're responsible. It's home ownership. They're responsible for the mortgage, the insurance, the property taxes, any fees. If they have a lawn or a driveway, they need to take care of that too. Um, uh, they can leave the property to someone else in their will. But the difference is that they have to work through their local nonprofit when they decide to sell and that they've agreed to a resale formula that preserves that affordability. So they have all the other rights and responsibilities, but we, we um, the exchange for getting that assistance to buy the per, buy the property in the first place um, results in their agreement, like they're agreeing to keep the affordable affordability mechanism in place for the next buyers. So just real quickly at the sale, um, uh, the nonprofit will identify a new buyer. Usually those people are coming through our home buyer education classes. We do a new appraisal. And then the original subsidy um, that came into the property stays there. They don't, the, the seller does not take away that original subsidy, it stays with the property. The seller does receive though, anything they paid down on their mortgage, this is much different than renting. You pay your rent to your landlord, you, you walk away with, um, uh, with no equity. So they get everything that they pay down on their mortgage. If they decide to improve their kitchen, put a deck on the, on the, on the house, anything that they can, we can document that they improve the value they get 100% of that, but they only get 25% of the increase in the home value from the time that they purchased to the time that they sell. The new buyer, as it, again, takes this home buyer education class. They get a mortgage that's equal, and I'll do the math for this in a second. They get a mortgage that's equal to the appraisal minus the original subsidy and minus 75% of any of the market appreciation from the time that the original buyer bought and then the sale. And then they agree to that same resale formula. So this is where doing math in public is a little dicey sometimes, but let me just walk you through this. If you look on the original purchase column, say the original appraisal was at $200,000. We have a subsidy that's, that's usually around 20, it's usually at 20% to avoid the private mortgage insurance expense that people have to pay. So we, the original subsidy is 40% or $40,000. The buyer's mortgage, the original purchase, would be 160,000. They live in it for five, six, seven years. They decide to sell. We do another appraisal. The home has increased in value from 200 to 240,000. The original su subsidy is still the same. It's 40,000 dollars. You take 75 percent of the appreciation, the difference between 240 and 200. 75% of that, you leave it in the home as an added to the subsidy. So that's $30,000. The new, new buyer's mortgage is $170,000. The seller, the original owner, gets whatever they paid down in their mortgage plus 25% of the appreciation, or in this case, it's $10,000. So they get the whatever they paid down in the mortgage plus $10,000 in this example. Um, Sarah Robinson and her husband Colin, may, some of you may know these, these folks. Um, I know they've been around the state house a little bit. They did this. They, um, uh, they bought one of our homes. They lived in it for several years, had a couple of kids, decided that they wanted a, a bigger house and they moved out. And they were able to take the equity that they earned in the shared equity home and buy on the market. Tony alluded to some of this. Uh, um, uh, some of this as well, that these are, uh, this is a growing um, kind of model around the country, but it's also growing around the world. 
uh, back in 2008, the Champlain House Trust received the United Nations World Habitat Award. We've received other kind of recognitions nationally that have kind of elevated this, this model. And I know Tony must get these um, every week. If we get them every week, we get um, calls all over the place um, from county governments and cities asking how we do this. Um, so, oh, just one, one last slide about, uh, um, again, this is a workforce. This is someone that works, um, at least when he bought, he worked at the um, Bell's Free Academy in, in St. Albans. Um, he pays less in mortgage than he's paying in rent. So I think that's it. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Chris. Um, Barbara, or Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. And I, I just wanted to thank everyone for their information. As a newbie to the committee, it's it's a, a great uh, primer as well as just background for lots of what we've already done and hope to do. And I just want to jump on what Chris closed with, which it's always broken my heart that it's more affordable truly to own a home than to rent in so many circumstances if you can just get in. The, the monthly cost is so often actually less so I really appreciate um, all of the work that goes towards helping people over that entry and, and being able to start investing. So thank you. Um, if I may just add to that, thank you, Representative Murphy. Um, the other big benefit is that it stabilizes your housing costs too. So you're not, have, you're not seeing a rent go up each, you know, each year. So it's stabilizing your costs as you're building, as you're like it's for saving as you're building equity. So um, getting more people access to that is and receiving a tax benefit, mm -hmm. right? Which is um, as mentioned earlier, is really the the mortgage tax benefit for homeowners is is one of the biggest subsidy housing subsidies that the country in um, works with. Representative Klacky. Thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome to everyone. Welcome back to many of you. Glad to see you all. Uh, Chris, I wanted to make sure I understood uh, not, not your addition or subtractions in the, in the mortgage part, but if someone, you, you said improves their kitchen or improves their deck, that also often improves the appraisal of the house. So how does the, does the person get a proportion that 25% of the approval in the mortgage on the way out, or do you get the costs of putting the new deck that also increases the it's, price of the house? It, yes, it's good. Good question. Um, it's it's um it's something that we um, we negotiate with the with the owners. You know, they have to document that they put this in, and then the appraisal will demonstrate what the value. Of the of the improvement is so a deck is a little simpler than a, say a kitchen, um, but um, we do we don't want to prevent or dis disincent people to make investments in their homes. Okay, and I just want to make sure I got your percentages correctly. That twenty five percent of the communities served are Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Is that correct? Over the last five years, over the last five twenty five percent of the buyers over overall in our portfolio of six hundred and fifty or so homes, about fourteen percent are people of color. Okay, thank you. And then my last question is for Tony, if I may. Um, Tony, of your two hundred fifty thousand units, I, I think that's what you said. Um, how many are actually in Vermont? Uh, I'll defer to Chris to answer that okay. question since I don't have the current number. We're, we're approaching 1,200 representative Kalaki and they've been okay. home to 18, more than 1,800 households. Okay, beautiful. Thank you all. And hello to Nancy as well. <laughs> Guys. Representative Bloomley. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, guests. Um, well, for the presentation, but also for uh, 
for this work. I, 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 th I think the model is so brilliant um, and it, you know, it makes so much sense, but uh, you know, it, it had to be invented. And, I, and I'm really proud of Vermont for being such a national leader. I, I, can, I confess that I am confused, um, Nancy. Um, I mean, I, I just don't fully understand your um, comment about there's a lot of pressure on the market there are threats to um, housing that were financed through tax credits, but now want to convert um, to market rate housing. And can you explain kind of, can you give me a, an example so that you play that out so I understand what you're talking about? Sure. Um it's not an entirely new thing. You know, Gus no mentioned that, um, you know, when properties are financed with a federal subsidy, they might be financed for 30 years or 20 years or something. And, our, um, and at the end of that period, the owner has the option to pay off that loan or do something else and convert to market rate. What's happening in the tax credit industry in recent time in the last three or four years there had always been a pattern where the investor, the bank investor, had um, been satisfied with their investment at the close of their um, of the compliance period for the tax credit partnership. They got their tax credits, they got the benefits they expected, they got the return they expected, and they exited the partnership and left the owners to do with the project what they will. Now, when the owner um, when the project is perpetually affordable, to do what they do would be to continue to operate it as affordable housing. In recent years, there's been uh, some syndication firms who, and it's not, the, it's not the banks, it's the intermediary, it's the syndication firm, who are pressuring the owners to, um, get as much cash flow out of the project as possible and, and strip the project of money. And they're not, they're, they are, <laughs> they're changing the economic model of the whole system um, and introducing some really predatory and aggressive practices that we have not seen before. And so there's a group of people that I'm working with on a national level that are educating developers and housing finance agencies and others about this practice. Um, there have been significant lawsuits um, with these organizations and HFAs and, um, and nonprofits and owners that are super costly where they're litigating the terms of the investment and, um, and owners are losing and these bad actors, these bad syndicators, are taking over projects and converting them to market rate housing. There's a terrific news article that was published last week from um, uh, WBUR in Boston. I can send a link if folks are interested. That would sum up this up more quickly and easily. So I think that's probably the best way. And I would just say, as a strategy, as we're looking to prevent this from happening, um, our, our perpetual affordability covenants are one of the strong measures that help limit that opportunity for those bad actors to convert our housing. And, I, and, and it's, it's happening nearby, it's happening in Boston, it's happening in New Hampshire, there's litigation going on. So, um, and it, it stems from, you know, just the pressures to the value that's here, right? The rising rents, you walk into certain, some communities, whether it's you know the Upper Valley or Chittenden County or even St. Albans or other Montpelier where the rents are rising so fast that um, the difference between that affordable rent and the market rate rent is so substantial that people can see how they can cash out and get that value. So that's why I was talking about the pressure on the market. But I will, I will provide that link to that article because it's, it's much more, a clear and uh, succinct and tells the story well. Well, I not what you said was pretty clear, but but that'll help too. Thanks very much. Yeah.
Tony, um, in your slide deck, there was the page four of your slide deck had a, a map that was showing um, shared equity homes across the country. And again, I can be, I mean, we, we do all this work in Vermont and your, your map reflects about, uh, about how much is being done in Vermont. And, and I kind of want to turn that a little bit and say, you know, this is what we think is normal. This kind of work and these kinds of conversations and the, and the map reflects that, but to share with me more about what's going on in the other 49 states where it's not as densely green on your map. Um, um, some years ago now, I went on a mission trip to Biloxi, Mississippi, and it was five years after Katrina and Biloxi said, you know, remember Katrina hit us. You know, it, it flooded New Orleans, but it hit us. And we were down and we were fixing some homes and the folks at, at the Back Bay Mission were just, I was asking them about what happens when their affordable housing goes off their deals and there's a threat of them going to, and they were like, we don't have affordable housing like that. And that's what this map reflects to me. And I just, if you could just share some thoughts on your, your, your research or your just, what do you see out there? I, I, see, I see a lot of empty areas. Certainly, um, you're correct. Um, you have a, a robust uh, approach to permanently affordable housing. It is not as common uh, in the rest of the country and, and the map certainly reflected that. I will say um, our survey of our membership shows that the majority of shared equity programs, they are small nonprofit organizations, mostly with five or less staff, full-time staff members. So that is also one of the challenges that we're working on in this effort to increase the scale of shared equity housing across the country over the next 10 years is to build more technical capacity and provide assistance and education to train a workforce that can actually effectively implement these programs in other parts of the country. I will say um, in terms of numbers of organizations, actually, no surprise, California has about 33 um, organizations in our membership that are really focused around the, the shared equity approach. But when you think about the size of the, the state, um, that's kind of a, a drop in the bucket in, in terms of meeting their affordable housing crisis. And it is, no, no question about that, even before the pandemic, uh, the numbers from the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies said that 18 million families across the country were paying more than 50% of their income for housing costs. And that was both renters and homeowners. So uh, again, it was a problem even before the pandemic. It's now been exer exacerbated um, further. Uh, our approach um, really has been to seek more um, resources in terms of philanthropy and from uh, the federal side, we actually have introduced a bill um, in Congress right now as part of this infrastructure package, the housing portion, it's called the Restoring Communities Left Behind Act. Um, it would actually, if passed, uh, result in five billion a year for the next 10 years to really uh, focus on a variety of community uh, development programs with shared equity and community land trust being specifically called out in that bill along with some other um, things that we feel would, would be effective. And so having those kinds of resources is what's needed to build the field and have more impact. And uh, you're correct, all of our members here in the US and uh, across the world are pointing to the, the work of you all in Vermont as the way forward. You, you are the example that, that everyone is look, looking toward. Chris had it right in his slides. And so um, we are trying to promote that as much as possible. Even um, in recent weeks, uh, we were all cheering because the New York Times chose to cover our work and really um, highlight the fact that uh, creating permanently affordable housing is a necessity to create a, a protected stock of affordable units to prevent this expiration of, of affordability. The, the thing that Nancy is talking about, the same thing happens on subsidized, traditionally subsidized home ownership programs where there is no requirement for permanent affordability. 
So when the compliance period ends, and sometimes um, depending upon how it's structured, that could be uh, five years, and there's no requirement to pay back really the initial subsidy. And even when there is, once you pay that back, trying to produce another affordable home costs you more than you're getting back in terms of the, the subsidy uh, recovered. So again, we're, we're in this sort of cyclical issue that permanent affordability could help, help to solve. And you know, when I talk about these things, I, I also forget to share sometimes that I myself am a community land trust practitioner. I have started a community land trust organization. So I know what it's like to be an executive director of a startup nonprofit trying to introduce a new approach, which I can tell you um, oftentimes is not understood by the public funders, nor the private lenders, nor by the people who are actually in need of these homes to have affordable places to live. So you're trying to educate across a variety of different interests to make people understand the effectiveness uh, of the approaches. And uh, also to Nancy's point, uh, an increasing number of our members are also working on the multifamily rental side, putting multifamily rental properties through partnerships with either mission-based or even private developers on protected, permanently affordable leased land to give them an element of control. So when the compliance period ends from, from the tax credits, the, the mission-based landowner steward entity is able to step in and either find another partner or even have a first right to purchase those uh, properties and keep them affordable. So we're increasingly pushing forward um, with even business planning for startup community land trust entities to incorporate both rental and home ownership. So the ARPA money that's available across the country, um, of course, we're, we focus in on what we receive, um, which, over the last year has been tens of millions of dollars more than we've received ever. And we're at the cusp of figuring out how to build a systemic change in our, in our housing. Again, how are other states treating the same? I mean, they're, they're getting more simply because they're larger states, but and I'm, I'm assuming that their needs are as exponential as, as, as the amounts of money are, but what are you seeing um, in the initial stages of this money becoming available in the planning for, for what, what we're trying to do? I'll say it, it varies widely. I think it also depends upon the awareness of advocates in each particular state. In places like in New York, there are advocates who are actually being very effective in directing that funding towards uh, community land trust and other shared equity models. But um, you, you mentioned there are places in the country, and I would say um, in the deep south, where that's really less the case and most of it is being channeled into, I would call it more traditional affordable housing uh, approaches and really um, dealing with homelessness is uh, actually one of the really elevated issues in most of the larger urban areas. And so a lot of it's being directed toward that. Um, one thing I can tell you is we were successful um, in 2019 in partnering with NeighborWorks America um, through a lot of advocacy from the Vermont delegation um, here in DC. Uh, to secure a $2 million, sounds small, uh, federal appropriation for education and training. And we're now putting that out. We are serving uh, 33 organizations in 28 states to incorporate shared equity into their affordable housing approaches. So those are existing, for the most part, mission-based organizations who are incorporating uh, that as an aspect of their work. And, and they are then in turn acting as the advocates um, in their states to secure more resources for that. So um, we're replicating that program again. So we'll have another cohort uh, of states and organizations uh, that we're working with um, here before the end of the year. But again, it's another one of those things where we need more resources in order to uh, really engage more entities in understanding how to do it. Uh, 
we've been working with uh, both Fannie and Freddie for the last several years to create specific mortgage products and educate lenders in what's necessary in order to make shared equity home ownership work as well. So we're making progress on that score. Um, we're even beginning to investigate um, some efforts to create acquisition funds so that we can be as nimble as some of the private players who have amassed capital and who are simply waiting to identify what they call distressed properties to acquire and convert to market. So we could intervene uh, effectively in that process if we were able to create an acquisition fund that was national in scope to be able to do that. Um, you mentioned NeighborWorks and I wanna go to Gus and say, Gus, NeighborWorks is an integral uh, affiliation in our state as well. Could you just give us a, a, a quick rundown of what NeighborWorks means to Vermonters? Um, Chris may be able to do that more than I, but I'll, I'll just say we have five organizations in Vermont that are part of the NeighborWorks America network. And being part of that network brings all kinds of financial and technical support. They have great training institutes uh, that they've actually made available to our whole network, whether you're a NeighborWorks affiliate or not. Uh, but it, they they're a national intermediary um, chartered by Congress, and um, and it is, and we actually have more NeighborWorks affiliates in Vermont, and you can guess the reason why than any other state in the country. Um, so we're very fortunate that way. Chris, do you have anything to add? No, I think I think Gus captured that um, perfectly. You know, they they provide not just the training and technical assistance, but they also provide resources for capacity for the nonprofit network in the state, and um, as well as some capital resources. So it's um, it's really uh, they're they've been a great partner. Yeah, it's just another word we're going to hear, just as we as as we deal with uh, the nonprofit. Um, housing organizations in the state as well. Any further questions for our guests, guests today? That was, this is a lot of information, um, but I think I'll appreciate Zoom for a minute and, and, and just say that it's uh, on tape. And I think this is, this is gonna be important information for us to be able to, we can come back to this anytime we want, um, which is, which is a little different than what it has been. So I'll appreciate um, this two-dimensional world uh, a little bit in that way. Um, any further questions? Any last questions for our guests? All right, thank you so much, Chris, for setting this up. Um, Tony and Gus and Jen and Nancy, thank you for being a part of this conversation. It's really... Um, it's there. I treat these as seeds and maybe seedlings of information and um, and we'll see how they grow during our off time. And we'll see we'll see some of you or some, most of you back next year as well. But I'm sure we'll be seeing more of our local folks. But Tony, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yes. And I, I have other connections in Vermont, as Nancy knows. So uh, I'll be maybe running across you at some point in the future as well. But it was a pleasure to join you. And thank you for all the hard work that you all do. Well, as we say here in Vermont, you're two degrees of separation, not six. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you. And Take committee, um, committee, we have a version. I believe everybody's received a version, uh, the latest version of um, S79. And we will pick up with that after the floor today. Um, and uh, with the goal to getting it voted out of committee. Representative Hango. Yes, thank you. Um, in that document, are the changes um, highlighted somehow? Yes, yes. You know what color the changes are? Um, David's following the same scheme that he has done before. So he's this, this version still has the um, the yellow, but also the, the changes that we made are bl in blue. So when you scroll through and for instance, get to a particular page on the, 
uh, the language that we would focus on first today, which is about the um, uh, home share language that we still have to finish up with, you'll find it in blue. And does, does it differentiate how it changed from last night's version? Oh, I. That's what I, I meant. I, I I think these are all the changes that have been pr been provided by David. So um, yeah, the reason I'm asking is because it uh, Ron's email says that there are minor changes to last night's version, and I I spent a lot of time going through last night's version, and now I'll have to spend a lot of time going through this version to figure out what changed from last night, unless they're highlighted. My, my impression from David, and we can, we can ask him, but from the email, since the document didn't change draft number or timestamp, is that these were editing catches, commas and okay. capitals and lowercase. That's my impression. Fair enough. Uh, Thank that you. That these were not substantive changes in any way. And will David we... be with us at our afternoon hearing so we can I, ask him that? I believe oh, I... so. Certainly hope so. He'll have a front row seat. Um, Thank you. The other thing to keep in mind to, to look at uh, before we before we work. So there's there's a section about the home shares, but also go back and look at the uh, the section on the eviction moratoriums. There was just a technical. Uh, David had a technical change that he felt was technical, and he can explain it when he comes in about keeping in the a the the. Um, Administrative Order 49, which hasn't expired yet. So he kept that in and then added our language as an extension or as an addition to that. You can see it and he can explain it later. I haven't seen it yet, um, but he had just said that the, the, the AO 49 has not expired yet. So he, he felt that it was appropriate to keep it into the, the language on the, on, that we added on the moratorium. So just take a look at that. But with that, thank you, everybody. Oh, Representative Kalaki. Well, you know, I want to apologize to the committee. Yesterday, I got um, overheated over our, our our shared home kind of discussion, and I, I took to heart what the chair said about the tenor of our relationships. And you know, as we go into the next two or three weeks, I really want to hold each of you dear. And so, I apologize if I became strident or or sharp and. Um, I also apologize to our presenters last night. I wrote them and it, you know, they are there giving us their best selves. And I did not bring my best self forward in the conversation yesterday. So anyway, um, thank you all for that. And I really do uh, cherish this committee. And it, to me, it's a reminder of keep that blood sugar up without gaining 10 pounds over the next two weeks. Um, because the sitting and sitting and talking is exhausting. Um, the other, um, so just before we go, I just want to make sure that you saw that um, there's the that Ron has posted the article from WBUR. Another article, and if, if I think about it, I'll I'll, I'll share it this way too. Um, we didn't talk about it today, but uh, there was an article in the New Yorker magazine about a month ago about um, investment groups buying up mobile homes in other parts of the country. And then what happens is what hap you know, what, it, it happens often, right? They decide they need to cut expenses. And so infrastructure needs drop off, garbage tr pickup drops off, you know, just the maintenance of the park drops off, the rents go up. And it's a pretty fragile ecosystem. The mobile homes, mobile home parks are, are very fragile ecosystems. And so we haven't seen it. I don't think we've seen it in this state yet. Um, we're, some, we're an out of state company um, or investment firm has come in to buy up the real estate and, and treat these parks you know, in ways that, that make the living situation more difficult. Our, our protections when home when when parks go up for sale are pretty robust in terms of time frames and trying to get the owners to decide or the residents to get basically give the residents a right of first refusal to see if they can put together a syndicate to put together and and then we have an infrastructure that's growing in Vermont I think we took testimony that said we're up to like 
18 cooperative parks or total, you know, we're, we're growing our numbers of, of protecting parks in that way. But anyway, it's just another mobile home parks are an integral part of our mobile home, um, our affordable housing infrastructure. So it's just, it, it, it might just be more reading for us to just be aware of moving forward. Um, I don't think it has any direct impact on the budget this year, except for in terms of that fear. So, um, but it's out there. All right, let's go have lunch. Speaking of blood sugar, and we'll see you on the floor and then we'll see you back in committee afterwards.